So good day, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Community Central. Um, we're pleased to have you here with us today. Um, before we get started with our panel of guests, um, quick housekeeping. If you have questions um, for our panelists at the end of their uh, presentation, please use the Q&A tool within um, Google's live stream, and we will get those answered for you um, after the presentation is over. So without any further ado, I'm very pleased to once again welcome Lisa Kaywood um, from the Open Source Program Office here at Red Hat. Lisa, uh, welcome and let us know what, what we're gonna be talking about today. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome back to um, the second episode of this season's Community Central series. Um, this season, we're talking about um, open source projects and other types of open upstream um, groups that we work with, um, their governance and how we engage with them. So today, we're going to be looking at um, when we choose to join a, a, a group, um, an open source foundation or others, and um, kind of looking at it throughout our life cycle. How do we evaluate it on an ongoing basis and when we might choose to leave it? So with me today, I have Jeffro Ozie Mixon um, and Kelly Dolph Dolphy. Who, um, all of us are in the Open Source Program Office. We all have slightly different um, takes on the the open source landscape, um, coming from slightly different backgrounds. But um, I will start things off. Uh, let's start things off, Kelly, with um, where are we, how we decide to join a new group. All right, so um, we have sort of four main categories of uh, consideration. Um, sometimes uh, we join for technical reasons. It's an interesting new technology, um, something that's gonna be important for our product portfolio. Um, sometimes it's sales driven. A customer wants us to join a particular group. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, it's a nagging industry concern. Um, interoperability types of groups are, are kind of a really key factor in this. And sometimes it's because our competitors are in a particular group and we want to make sure that we understand um, what they're working on and, and kind of where they're going. And, you know, also partners and, and customers are, are, are there as well. So um, that's kind of the, the sort of the top level. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Jeff Rowe to, to, to talk a little bit about maybe a couple of, um, he has some interesting stories um, and I, I will add on to, to what he has to say um, about why, why we join a particular community. Sure. Well, one thing that I notice when I do these evaluations about a specific community is to, um, to, uh, to find the balance among these four, these four uh, topic areas. Um, if, a, for example, if, if there may be a strong reason for a strategic involvement that may not have any customer interest at all. And so we have to take that into account when we when we make a decision or make a recommendation back to whoever is requesting that we join this community. Um, very often the uh, the request to join the community comes from us. Uh, that was, you know, especially if we're starting on a new vertical venture for example automotive is one of the projects uh, or one of the initiatives um, that i helped set up a lot of the uh, the community strategy for and um you know there's a if there's a new business unit there's a new engineering team forming they don't necessarily know what the community landscape looks like so that's the way that i usually start is by trying to understand you know the big picture of the landscape um and I, and I think it's, it's it's worth noting there that it's it's not something that that you do in isolation, right? It's it's part of the process of understanding the whole goal of the initiative and and kind of what are the OKRs for automotive, broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. um, where are we trying to get to, and how do we map our our goals with the with the industry landscape? Yeah, and those goals are often uh, evolving. So sometimes it's not just a single decision. Sometimes we will, you know, engage with one community, and then that community, I won't, I won't say crashes and burns. Sometimes the community will become less relevant, or, 
or uh, um, not, it, w it won't fulfill its own goals. And so then we'll look at a different com at different communities. And um, sometimes, as in automotive, a lot of the communities will will there will be new ones that split off or new ones that form. And um, we might end up joining a bunch of them. I think we have nine different uh, engagements right now in automotive specifically. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, it's a dynamic process. Yeah, so, and I think, I mean, you mentioned that you know, when we start up a, a new initiative, um, obvious, oftentimes the, the uh, community strategy sort of arises from within OSPO. Um, but there are other cases, especially like uh, in more established groups where the customer is saying, we want you in this community, or our partner is saying, we want you in this community, um, where it's really a much more um, cross-functional exercise. And we do have a, we, we, we call it a business justification document. Um, mm -hmm. It's really just a, a framework or an outline um, for working through the thought process of defining what our goals are for joining any particular community um, and agreeing in advance that we, you know, there may there may be a point at which there is a useful and necessary off ramp. So for example, um, if a customer is asking us to join a particular community, we need to understand what those customers' expectations are for our participation. Um, you know, if if they want us to, you know, do a specific task for them, that's good to know. And so we note that. Um, if it's just because they want us, you know, sort of keeping an eye on the technology, um, is it because they eventually expect us to productize it? That's good to know. Um, so those are all things that we will discuss and document as part of that evaluation process. Um, and so it's not it's not simply just a matter of well our customer says we want we want to do it and and we have the money in our budget you know in in sales or whatever so we're going to go do it it is a cross functional thing because um, you know eventually it will wind up touching other groups for example if the customer expects something to be productized then the the product teams need to be aware of that and you know be on board with with the the possibility. Um, you know, ultimately within OSPO, we, um, you know, have to staff it and support the, those engagements. And so we need to be prepared for that as well. So it is very much a, a consensus driven exercise, certainly within, within Red Hat. Um, it's certainly advisable, even if you're, if you're not Red Hat, if you're another organization. Um, I think it's also worth noting that um, when we have uh, a new um, community that we're joining, um, you know, many times I see, I see companies join a, com a, a community, not really knowing what they're supposed to do when they get there. Um, this particularly happens with, uh, companies who join at kind of lower levels of membership. Um, sometimes the, they just want their, their logo on the website. Um, and then, you know, a year or two later, budgets are different and somebody looks at that and says, well, what are we getting from this? And the answer is nothing because you've put nothing into it. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's really important to think in advance about how you're going to engage with that community. Um, and this goes back to the goals of, of joining the community. Um, because if you're simply showing up to put the, your logo on the website and your, your sole goal is to have a press release, well, that's a very expensive press release. Um, and you still want to think, even if it's purely for marketing reason, you still want to think about, you know, what are you going to get from that press release? What are, what are the ongoing, um, you know, marketing benefits from that press release? Um, but really, you should be thinking about how do we engage with this, broadly speaking, from a from an engineering perspective. How do we support the 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 group? You know, do we need to to have marketing people in the group to help to support the, the group's marketing and, and outreach. Um, so there are a, a number of considerations from the perspective of, do we have the resources to put into the community to make it worthwhile and get ROI out of it? Yeah, very well said. I'd agree with all of that. It has to be a cross-functional team and it, it, there has to be more people involved with it than, than just throwing it over the wall to an OSPO or to a marketing team and saying, you know, this is just a logo. Yeah. Yeah. That's not an effective way to it to engage. 
Yeah. Um, Kelly, do you want to do you have uh, do you want to add on to this? Yeah, I'll go to the next slide and first introduce what um, the platform and the visualizations that we'll be seeing throughout this presentation. Um, as this will go, Lisa and Jeffro will talk about these topics um, from a lot of different perspectives, and I will be coming in to show what graphs and visualizations go along um, with the, these ideas. And these graphs come from the 8 Knot dashboard. Um, which is under the Aspen project and we take um, repo information and it's put into a database that is under the Augur project and we take that data and we make visualizations. And so as we go through this talk, I'll be kind of hopping in to show some examples of what I look at from like a data science standpoint when questions come up. There are a few general visualizations that I look at in most scenarios. But for the most part, analysis is catered to the situation. I'll listen to the questions and the priorities of the given situation, usually from a more broad perspective, not just specific to data, and then start to consider how those general community questions could be assisted um, We're using the data available for us. And so, and for the specific topic we've been talking about, here are some of the related graphs that I would look at whenever somebody would be talking about joining a community. Um, the first one, looking at project velocity, and this is comparing um, the velocity of, a, of multiple different projects where each of these dots represent, in this example, just I put a couple of different AI ML projects in there, and it plots pretty much their relative size of their contributor base with some information about issues and PRs, and you can decide whether which actions matter most to you. Um, and so this is one graph that I'd look at of trying to consider joining a community. Another one, this is one from an entire page that's dedicated to it, which is organization associated activity. So for these domains, how much activity is associated with them in some ways, pretty much meaning has a this email in their account, even if they don't use this specific email for the action. Um, but there's about six different graphs that we look at organizational diversity to be able to get a holistic view. But this is just one of the graphs that I wanted to show for this presentation. Yeah, and it's it's important to understand though so a couple things here. Um, one, uh, what Kelly is, is is showing here is a, is a tool that we within Red Hat. Um, use frequently when we kind of go through these evaluation exercises. Um, it is also um, accessible to some degree um, for people outside of Red Hat as well. Um, we use it when we start when we start looking at a community um, sometimes and then also sometimes um, as we kind of kind of continue to evaluate a community kind of on an ongoing basis. Um, we're going to talk about I think in the, in the next couple of slides is just sort of the, the different factors we look at. Um, when we when we look at a community, um, so let's let's go on to that that next um, section of what to consider when we look at a community. Um, so, and there's a question in the chat about whether there needs to be a direct or immediate commercial interest before Red Hat gets involved, and the answer mm -hmm. is no, right? That that goes back to that that sort of that first bullet on the previous slide, um, where we're looking at perhaps at a bleeding edge strategic investment or replacing some bets. Um, it might be several years before the, the technology itself gains traction in the industry, before we productize it. Um, we're, we're, we might be you know, placing bets in two or three different areas within a general space um, and seeing kind of what gets traction. Um, so in some sense, you can almost think of it, um, especially when we're looking at early stage technology as um, Kind of a little bit of VC activity from a you know engineering type VC activity in terms of sort of placing a bunch of bets in a bunch of different places and um, you know helping each community as we can, um, but also seeing you know being prepared that some of them are going to have more but more 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 traction than others and you know putting a bunch of chips on board. So, so venture so, community. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of venture capital. Community. Um, so that's actually a, a great segue to to this next slide. Um, you know, we we look. One of the things we look at, uh, if we could go back, 
Um, one of the things we look at is the maturity of a project. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer here. All of these things are taken um, together and within the context of um, how we need them, how we want to use them. Um, so again, for a really young, leaning edge type of technology, it's absolutely to be expected that any of the projects involved are going to be you know, pretty immature, and that's fine. Um, for something that is a more mature uh, technology or technology space, um, you know, we we often want to join projects kind of early on in their their life cycle. But perhaps you know, when they were younger, it was not a place that we were especially interested in, and we've gotten more interested in over time. And so we joined a more mature community, and and that's that's great. Um, and but you know, it, that that comes with with um, different considerations. Um, so, for example, and this is particularly true with um, when it comes to governance and community architecture and so on, a, a very young community might need a lot of help um, in setting up uh, their governance structure and their processes and just their infrastructure for how they operate. Um, because you know, oftentimes, um, you know, something that's, that's just sort of really brand new in a brand new space, um, the people who are starting it really know code, but don't necessarily have um, a ton of, of background in kind of these more sort of um, squishier kinds of things um, in terms of how to set up a, a project um, that meets legal requirements that that is going to allow for uh, governance um, that is flexible enough uh, to allow for growth, uh, that is going to set up, be, be open to uh, a broad range of contributors, um, so forth and so on. Um, so, you know, that's, that's an area where, where we as Red Hat, um, you know, have a very long um, history of engaging and supporting because this is something we have a, a long history of having background in. Um, with other projects that are more mature, often their leadership and their governance are also more mature. Um, and sometimes that's great and things are running really well. Sometimes people or processes have gotten entrenched and they got entrenched at a time where it made sense for them to be entrenched. But perhaps uh, the community or, or project is um, in a place where um, different things need to be um, considered. Um, and that's, you know, those are, those can, can be sometimes, you know, challenging um, things to navigate through. So it's just, it's, it's being aware of those considerations um, is an important part of the evaluation process. And I know, Jeffrey, you have a, a, a few fun stories here also. Um, yeah. <laughs> there are there i mean I, could, be, could be admitted to uh to uh protect the guilty <laughs> yes i'm uh i'm 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 working on anonymizing things in my head so um yeah there's definitely um uh well one thing i do want to say also is that it's very important to understand how much of a feedback loop this is that when we go into a project and determine that it is healthy or an unhealthy every every everybody who participates in that project feeds into that process so we can go in and make a project healthier uh we are just as capable of going in and making a project less healthy <laughs> so um one of the ways that i think we can really help um help mitigate and manage that process is with the data that comes from uh cali's efforts in eight knot uh, i find that to be extremely valuable to uh, to understand you know the project health as an ongoing thing you know it's just like personal health it's not something that you just establish once and then um, and then it stays static but uh, yeah in terms of um, of uh, project health uh, it is definitely possible to take a, a new project and to set it going in the right direction um, with some with some just by by following best practices of open source. And uh, those are fairly well documented, I think, out in the world. And uh, we also have a number of um, of uh, presentations within OSPO that we can provide both internally and externally to customers or to partners or to anybody to um, to talk about that kind of that kind of stuff. 
Let's talk a little bit also about um, sort of number three and four there, um, community architecture and audience and awareness. Um, again, when it, especially when a project is new um, and it's it's really being led by you know the people who came up with the code, um, these tend to be sort of afterthoughts, um, but they are really what make the difference in um, a project, you know, growing and taking off and and gaining traction in the in the bigger broader world. Um, so, do you want to give some examples, maybe, Jeffro, of of areas where you've contributed um, in those in, in those respects? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, one of the projects that we started working on recently, and this actually kind of goes back to the question that was asked earlier, uh, is a project called Rise. It is a, a Risk Five software ecosystem project, and um, you'll you'd notice by going to the Red Hat website that we don't actually have a Risk Five based product yet. So it is not something that we are actively doing uh, from a, a, a commercial standpoint yet. But we do see that there's going to be a lot of value in creating a healthy software ecosystem. And so we chose to be one of the founding members of this project. And, um, you know, uh, I saw that one of the one of the most valuable places that we could help here is with the outreach committee. And so um, I'm working with the outreach committee to do a lot of awareness around RISE and around Risk Five and how Fedora fits into all of that. And uh, and uh, also to, uh, you know, it isn't always just about promoting Red Hat stuff either. I mean, we do a lot of work to promote um, um, open source projects in the space that have nothing to do with Red Hat. Um, yeah. So that's one one example. Yeah, especially again with sort of new technology areas that um, yeah. that awareness and audience building is is really really key. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I'm I'm involved with sustainability uh, projects and efforts, and um, you know, one of the groups that I'm involved with, one of the most important subcommittees is actually the the community. It's called the communications uh, committee because um, as much as the any technology that that um, gets discussed by the group is actually um, uh, built by other uh, project groups within that within the foundation. Um, they are looking at it from a technology standpoint and not really from a why do you care and how is this going to benefit the world standpoint. And so that's really where the the the, the action group uh, around sustainability is is really you know a critical function is is really sort of helping communicate that those those ideas and those stories. Um, the other thing I would say is when it comes to um, community architecture, and this is kind of a a name shall be uh, uh, anonymized uh, to protect to protect folks. Um, it's really really important to set up open processes from the get go. Um, and I talked about this a little bit last time too. Um, if everything is happening via private email um, and uh, things are being kept in in sort of personal Google Drives and private repos, um, such that you know people who are not already involved in the project have to get in specifically invited one on one, um, and it's very hard to grow your community because you can't get the people sort of doing the casual looky loo. Um, oh, this looks kind of interesting. Let me find out more if they can't even see what's going on. Um, likewise, if you, you know, if your um, in project communications are entirely private via private emails, um, no one can see it. You know, if, 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 you know, everybody gets along great, everybody gets along terrible. There are lots of fights on the mail list. Um, these are all things that people like to look at before they get involved with a project, before they even sort of say, how do I get involved with the project? And um, and so your community architecture itself is a key piece of building awareness, building an audience, building outreach, and diversifying your community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. Um, Kelly, do you want to talk about a couple other things that you like look at? Yeah, for sure. Um, these are some examples of some graphs um, to be considered. To be considered, this is far from exhaustive and should evolve to each situation. There's actually a question in chat that I'm going to be using to um, show that. Mm. But one of the first ones that I 
always go to is this contributor growth by engagement graph. It shows the total number of contributor growth over time, which will always be up and to the right, but specifically breaks down your active and drifting categories. And that is something that for like users would define. So because in each community, somebody being considered active or a drifting member of the community, that timetable is going to look different. And so we allow for that flexibility, but I find it to be very interesting to see how that active and drifting bands how is it going up or down over time? And that usually can tell you a decent amount about the activity in the community. Um, another thing that I like to look at is pull request activity staleness and same for issues. And this has a very similar idea of showing the amount of open ish, open PRs, but broken down in a new stalling stale category that your user can define. So you're not just seeing, oh, there's, a thousand open issues, you can see that there's whatever it is, like 900 that have been open um, for at least over a month, but that new installing category is very small in comparison. So if you were looking at the interactive graph, we could click stale to be able to see the two other categories to be able to really hone in, but being able to see the breakdown of the data is really important. Um, the last one to point out would be looking at lottery factor, which people have priorly called bus factor. Um, and being able to see this over time is something that has been really interesting to me. If you look on this um, chart, it shows it by different action types. So whether it be commits, open issues, closed issues, comments, um, so on. And you can see how many contributors, what, like how many of the least amount of contributors that held 50% of that action. So the least amount of contributors in this time period that did 50% of the commits. And being able to see that move over time is really interesting. Um, so those are some of the ones I like to point out. I saw the question, the um the chat of about the xd one which i think is a really interesting scenario where it's now there's been more dive in there was a maintainer that was very overwhelmed and trusted somebody that they shouldn't and so this would be something that i'd be curious to look at some of our other graphs there's one that's a heat map around um activity around the repository and i'd be very curious to see how many of especially from a maintainer or reviewer standpoint of if there was a mass, uh, there was people that were leaving that were no longer active, or if that number just stayed really low. Um, and we can see even with like the lottery factor, looking into it and seeing, okay, with the PR reviewers, how low is this lottery factor? And so trying to see that before something happens and seeing, okay, my maintainers are vastly overwhelmed. Probably a lot of times doesn't take a chart to know that but still something to be able to look into and try to make more preventative actions than reactionary. Yeah, and it's especially uh, useful to use those graphs with people who are kind of a little bit further away from the project, um, but perhaps have, have uh, command of a lot of resources. So it's not just, um, oh, the maintainers feel overwhelmed, but here, here's the data, right? Right. That's Should we talk okay. a little bit about the, the lottery factor and, and why it's called that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I was also going to say that something that has been a really big surprise to me over the last year is that the value that has come from just being able to confirm that something is happening um, and allowing conversations to move from, is this happening, to, okay, we can confirm that it is, now what are we going to do? And it has allowed for, yeah, like just things to move on a little bit faster or get out of even just stalling in the what's going on category. And then talking about lottery factor, um, pretty much the idea, the analogy is, is that, okay, if one or two people won the lottery today and decided to never open up their computer again, what would the impact on the community be? Um, and so it's just the idea of, okay, if there is a couple of people who for whatever reason leave all of a sudden, to be able to understand the impacts that that would have on your community. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important factor to consider. You know, um, okay. it's a, it I would say that it is a best practice to strategize, you know, fairly early on in the project as the leaders begin to emerge about what is going to happen if those leaders 
win the lottery or get taken off onto some other project or for other for whatever reason are not able to participate anymore and this graph a graph like this is having it at, having it down in data to say wow mm -hmm. okay my my graph is totally wrong i need to do something about this um, could be a really motivating factor yeah, so I mean, I think all of these these things go back to to two things, right? One is one is governance and having healthy governance. The other part is is um, community diversity, and that means not just um, it can mean correct. contributor diversity. It can also mean organizational diversity, um, and that's where um, I think sometimes people will sort of get a little bit um, fixated on numbers in the absence of context. So um, oftentimes when uh, a project is new, um, you know, all of the committers will be from one company because it, 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 it um, arose out of that company. That's completely normal. That's completely to be expected. So, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, it's a Google project or it's a Red Hat project and, you know, sort of reject it out of hand, even though it's just a brand new project. And of course, all the committers are from that company. Um, the way you change it from being a Red Hat project is by getting committers from other companies. Um, and, you know, so it, that shouldn't be a gating factor in itself if, if, the, pro if the technology is in itself useful. Um, so the real question should be, is the technology useful? If yes, then how do we um, uh, up the, the committer diversity situation? Um, how do we help engage um, uh, committers from other organizations, other types of committers, people with different skill sets? Um, and that's that that then goes back to the question of um, outreach and community architecture. So all of these things come together, but they all mm -hmm. have to be considered in the context of uh, where the project is in its life cycle. All right, should we go on to the next section, which is when to leave? Um, this is so a tough here one. at Red Hat, we <laughs> here at Red Hat, we we evaluate all of our um, existing uh, sponsorships uh, every year um, as we as they come up for renewal, um, and uh, that's something that we in the Open Source Program Office kind of take the lead on because we manage all those memberships. That's not true in every organization. Um, but it is absolutely a best practice to um, have a good handle on who owns each of your projects um, and to take the opportunity every year to evaluate, are you getting what you wanted out of it? Um, and this, is, this goes back to why documenting what your goals were going in is really important. Are we still um, meeting our goals? Are we on track to meet our goals? Have our goals changed are, um, or are they, is the company just or the, the the project going in a different direction than what our company needs or are is the company going in a different direction than where the project is mm -hmm. all those things are, are are worth considering um there are some other things here um beyond just the, what the goals are but the you know the community the, the, is the community is still a healthy community um all the things we've just been talking about um, in terms of community health is there something that we can do to change um a, the health of a community if it's if it's kind of going in the wrong direction um is the company is the is the project just not re achieving liftoff in terms of um the technology being adopted if that if that's true is that you know is it because it's the wrong technology is it because the project has not been well um well marketed um you know do have we had the discussions with potential users about what they need to see um, or is it just simply, you know, outdated? I mean, projects, you know, technologies go through life cycles, projects go through life cycles. And at a certain point, sometimes you just have to, you know, gracefully recognize that the world has moved on and it's time to kind of put things in archive mode. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely seen you know, evidence of, of all of these. Um, I was remembering when you were talking just about a, a project that started up uh, several years ago in, in a, um, I will say it's in, it was in an industrial space and it had a number of different, very large companies that were very visible in that space participating, but um, it had very little, there were no strategists on board. Everybody was there to show up and do work, 
which is great, but there has to be some strategy behind it. And as a result, the project kind of uh, flailed and, and really only produced some excellent white papers, you know, talking about the 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 state of things and and not really plotting a strategy to move it from the, from one place to the next. Um, so I think it is possible to have uh, to have. Um, um, it is. It, I wanted to 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 go back to to what I had said earlier, which I think you also alluded to, which is that it is possible to affect these these projects in a very positive or even negative way depending on how we participate in them. And um, that is one thing that the OSPO can provide is some guidance on that. If you are in a project that you feel is not fulfilling its goals or not fulfilling it, not, not, not doing what it needs to do for the company, um, we can maybe help pull that apart a little bit and figure out where the, where the, where the issue is. And the data can help a lot with that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple other things that I think it's it's uh, worth highlighting here, especially for for companies where there isn't a centralized OSPO and isn't there is no centralized ownership for for memberships, for example, um, or even leaving memberships aside. Um, sometimes you have an engineer who happens to be particularly involved in a particular community and it's you know you know of moderate importance for the company, and then the engineer either gets put on a different project or leaves the company for a better. They won the lottery. They go to a better company, a, a, a different company, whatever. Um, and what what their management doesn't necessarily immediately recognize is that they were engaged in this in this project, and now that now nobody is because that that wasn't you know immediately on management's radar. Um, and so you have this this sort of orphan membership with nobody engaged anymore. Um, and so you know. That's why maintaining those that uh, sort of a database of where your memberships are and who is staffing um, those those engagements um, is really really important. Um, the other thing I would say, and this is kind of on on the first piece, um, if you decide to join, I mean to leave a project, either one personally leaves a project for whatever reason, or the company leaves a project for whatever reason. It's really important to do so in a friendly way. Um, just as you know, you don't want to burn bridges when you leave an employer. You don't want to learn burn bridges in a community. Um, your your presence in a community honestly carries lasts a lot longer than any particular relationship with any particular employer or any particular employee. Very true. There are some communities that I've been involved with now for three or four employers. Yeah, and I think you mentioned when we were talking about this earlier. There are some people in some communities whom you've worked with in in, in the past in <laughs> community activities. Yes. So if you see them in a new community, <laughs> what do you do? Yes. Um. I'm hopefully they're they're positively influencing kinds of people. But uh. But yeah. I mean, it it's it, what you realize quickly is that open source is a fairly small world. You know, as much as we know that there are millions of open source developers around the world, within each community, um, the world gets a lot smaller. And so, um, so it it really pays to to uh, to maintain those relationships. So, what are some thing. of the things that that what that let's say a company can do as it exits a a, a project or a foundation um, to maintain those those you know positive vibes and positive relationships? Well, the most important thing is to communicate early uh, about why this is the decision has been made. Um, you don't always necessarily need to to talk about the great details of, you know, my project lost funding or my, you know, our company's going in a different direction. But you want to be, you know, at least generally, um, the, the general message you want to get across is it's not you, it's me. And um, I would say that that's true at least 75% of the time. Um, there are times in which one, you know, would be leaving a community because we don't believe that that community is healthy anymore, or we believe that the governance changed in such a way that we we don't feel that we can we can participate well. Yeah. Um, it's important to make sure that everybody's face is saved in those circumstances. 
Um, and it takes, sometimes it takes a little bit of social dancing, but it's worth it. I mean, these, again, you're going to be running across these same people in the same industry in community after community. So, um, yeah, yeah no, we, I, I, we just had a, an instance of that in, in, uh, in my world. And, and, you know, I, I, I had been one of the board members, um, from, from Red Hat and I specifically made a point of joining the last board meeting that we you know, we were going to be part of and saying, hey, you know, we still support this this technology. We're very excited about this technology. We're happy to work with each and every one of you, you know, sort of in other communities where 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 this this technology is is being being promulgated. We're happy to work with you on a one to one basis. You know where to find me. I'm happy to help you in any way. Um, so I think that that, you know, being clear about that, you know, even if as a company we can't support a particular type of governance. Um, and, but separating that from all of the other factors in, in why we engage with these communities, um, which is really to engage with other companies, other individuals who have great ideas and, and figure out ways to collaborate with them. Like that's, that's really why we're all involved with, with open source. And so recognizing and, you know, sort of making a point that that's, that's still what we're really invested in, I mm -hmm. think is is really kind of important to do. Yeah, totally agreed. Uh, Callie, did you have any other thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a better example, uh, as good of an example as any of, I don't really have any specific graphs to show because each one of these scenarios is so unique. Um, but the biggest thing where I see how I come in is trying people trying to understand how for example red hat what would us leaving how would that impact the community to be able to have a more smooth transition out set up the community for success and i think that's kind of one of the many things that an individual or company can do to be able to leave in a more graceful way um and so that's where i a lot of times come in is trying to help a company, especially if it's not documented, understanding where where do we have players in this and how does that impact the overall community? Yeah. Yeah, very well said. All right. Well, I think at this point we can probably go to the QA. I think we've answered a couple of them already. There's a question here. I'm a new MDR and I would like to know what is this community? It's like the group from a project. Yes, the, it's it's any when we when we talk of a community, it's the people who are engaged in any particular project or other type of upstream group, um, whether they be uh, coders, uh, marketers, uh, documentation people, any you know any 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 of the, any and all of the people who are engaged with a particular um, project are are that project's community. Yeah. Yeah. There can be internal and external communities, too. Internally, we tend to call these communities of practice. And um, you can find those on the source if you look under communities. There's a, a in the upper banner. External communities, um, I'll give an example from automotive. For example, there's an automotive initiative at Red Hat creating an automotive product that is essentially RHEL for in, uh, in vehicle use. And uh, there's a number of external open source projects within communities that are dealing with similar issues. And so we try to, you know, in best open source practice, we try to go out and participate in those whenever we can. Um, the one that comes immediately to mind is the Eclipse Software Defined Vehicle Project, which is underneath the, it's a working group underneath the Eclipse Foundation. And um, Red Hat is a corporate member of the Eclipse Foundation, and then we're also members of this Eclipse SDV project. And uh, we hold a leader, couple of leadership positions. We've contributed software into the project or into the working group uh, as a specific project. And uh, we that's one of the places where we participate externally to, uh, and we have specific goals that we track around that. I hope that answers the question. Um, any other uh, questions? If you have a question now, now's a great time to put it in the Q&A. Um, you can find the Q&A. Uh, there's a little a little geometric shapes button in the far right corner of your screen. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, um, thanks for your for joining us. Thanks for your attention. And um, again, if you have any other questions for any of us, um, you know where to find us. Um, of course, uh, the source page is, is a great way to find us. And um, also, uh, 
OSPO is readily available um, to anyone within Red Hat. So thanks again and uh, have a great day.